right, well, thank you so much for coming out to our Fair Housing Month press conference. I'm just gonna say a couple of words to start us off and then we've got a bunch of great speakers to talk about the meeting of Fair Housing Month and why we're talking about the things that affect us today in housing. So Fair Housing Month, of course, is the celebration or commemoration of the signing of the Fair Housing Act. Uh, but fair housing goes back much farther, of course, than 1968. Housing, access to adequate housing, is a human right. And the Fair Housing Act was the result of a lot of movement, a lot of effort to try to get people to understand and make legislation to recognize that we need to protect people from discrimination and protect people from what had been happening. So there have been several efforts. Pittsburgh's own Fair Housing Ordinance predates the Fair Housing Act. It started in 1958 to try to get recognition that what we were seeing in housing was unfair and unequitable. And to this day, we're still working to try to undo the inequities that were created in the 1920s, 30s, 40s, 50s. So legislation itself can't make rec retroactive change, right? We have the Fair Housing Act, it guarantees certain rights to people from freedom from discrimination, but the Fair Housing Act also asks us to look back and to see what needed to have happened, what we need to change in order to achieve actual equity in housing. It couldn't do it looking back, so we have to move forward forward ourselves and to follow the mandates within the Fair Housing Act to create and dismantle, to create equity, but to dismantle the systems that created the inequity to begin with. So we are tasked with this through the Affirmatively Furthering Fair Housing mandate, it's a federal mandate, and not only are we tasked with this through a federal mandate, but we have an obligation as a society, as local government, to uphold the human right to access to adequate housing. Not only that, we have a duty to our citizens. We are not yet doing enough to ensure that the systems that we created as government are dismantled and that we're able to move forward and create fair housing for all people. So, in this month, Fair Housing Month, we're looking to our local government, to our housing advocates, to us as a society to say, what do we need to do? How do we move forward? And how do we push affirmatively furthering fair housing? And in the spirit of that, we're having this press conference. We're so happy to welcome Leilani Farha, who is the former UN Rapporteur on Adequate Housing, who has done extensive research to discover what are some of those systems that, are that have been created to hold us back from really achieving these goals. So thank you so much, uh, Ms. Farha, for joining us. And I'm gonna welcome some other speakers up to the podium. The first person that I'm going to welcome up is Megan Confer Hammond. She is the Executive Director of the Fair Housing Partnership of Greater Pittsburgh. The Fair Housing Partnership of Greater Pittsburgh is a really important partner for us at the Pittsburgh Commission on Human Relations. In our role as a Fair Housing Assistance Program, they act as the Fair Housing Initiatives Program under HUD, and they pr provide that advocacy and support to people, not just people, but to us as a government, to figure out how do we move forward, how do we really create equity in housing. So thank you so much, and I'm going to welcome up Megan Kahn for him. Thank you, Jan. Uh, I want to take a moment to simply say to recognize Fair Housing Month for April uh, as when the bill was signed into law by then President Lyndon Baines Johnson is to recognize that to hold an event on April 4th is to commemorate, to recognize, and to reflect that April 4th is the anniversary of the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And what is little known largely about his impact is that he was championing fair housing and housing justice, but was unable to get housing included in the Civil Rights Bill of 1964. 
It's his assassination on April 4th that resulted in an uprising amongst the country that created a congressional mandate for the then U.S. Congress to come forward to finally pass the Fair Housing Act and the protections that we have today. And so 1968 is not that long ago, and the blood, sweat, and tears that it took us to create the laws that we have today it's live on in what we continue to try to achieve because having legislation is simply one part of the effort. The second part is enforcement. Is the legislation being meaningful and enforced amongst our housing? And so what I want to discuss is that I am proud to celebrate April 2022 as Fair Housing Month with Mayor Ed Ganey's administration. I started at FHP in 2009. 2022 is my 13th Fair Housing Month, my fourth federal administration, and my third city of Pittsburgh mayoral administration. So I want to make a distinction. Fair housing overlaps with, but is not the same thing as affordable housing. For example, what we're seeing nationwide with reports of racial discrimination in home appraisals from Maryland to Indiana to California underscores the simple truth that no amount of money protects a family from housing discrimination. From a fair housing perspective, the city of Pittsburgh's loss of black Pittsburghers, based on the 2020 census, is the embodiment of our need to commit to a firmly furthering fair housing, or AFFH. Our city's racial segregation is stark, and it's not by accident. From the city's use of eminent domain in the Hill District in the 1950s for the then Civic Arena that stripped home ownership from Black Pittsburgh, to the $1 million fair housing settlement in the 1990s by the National Apartment Leasing Company that was based on allegations of denying Black applicants rental apartments in neighborhoods across the city such as Highland Park. I use those examples because today, when we look at the racial disparities in home ownership, about 35% of black Pittsburgh own their home, compared to about 74% of white Pittsburgh. The racial home ownership disparity that we have today that is the result of discriminatory policies that came before us are both greater than the national and regional norms. Additionally, today, the preliminary population data review by the, of the 2020 census by the University of Pittsburgh names Highland Park as one of the top 10 city neighborhoods with the largest population loss of Black Pittsburgh. So we are not the decision makers of these unequal outcomes, but we are the decision makers of today who must address the impact of the past. So today I ask all the city's decision makers, and that includes all of us who live here, to recognize that the opposition to new housing development that argues that we must preserve historical characteristics of a neighborhood may in fact be enshrining a built environment that was designed to intentionally segregate us by race. Remember that the population of Black Pittsburgh began to significantly increase around 1900 in tandem in what became known nationally as the Great Migration. The freed slaves left the rural South to the North and to the Midwest. In Pittsburgh, we then passed our first zoning ordinance in 1923. At that time, then U.S. Pennsylvania Senator David A. Reed argued, why residential lot varies from 4,000 square feet to 625 square feet based on the district. At that time, he asked why the determination of residential lot sizes were based on health and safety, but the numbers differed from Squirrel Hill to what was then called the East End. In his, head, in his own words, what were then considered the so-called best and the last districts. A hundred years later, that question remains. Prioritizing AFFH as a lens to assess the inequity that we inherited will not only confront the racial disparities that built our neighborhoods, but will also prompt growth. From 2020 to 2021, the census data is showing that Pittsburgh's population is shrinking, and growth requires inclusion. Moving forward, instead of defining the housing that we don't want, we must define the housing that we do want and what our values are. Perhaps our neighborhood values are housing with two or more bedroom sizes to include families with children, or new construction that's accessible to people with limited mobility, or the inclusion of affordable housing. And so for 2022's Fair Housing Month, I ask all of Pittsburgh to seek how you can make Pittsburgh a more diverse city for all of us to live in. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Megan. The next person that we're gonna hear from is Councilwoman Deb Gross from Pittsburgh Council District 7. Thank you all, and I really appreciate everybody's work in um, bringing us together for Fair Housing Month. And I see a lot of really uh, familiar faces in the audience who've been at this work a very hard time, and I want to acknowledge um, the work of everybody um, behind the cameras and everybody um, behind in front of the cameras as well. Uh, again, my name is Deb Gross, and I'm a member of Pittsburgh City Council. I represent um, District 7. District 7 encompasses eight city neighborhoods that begin at the edge of downtown and continue about five miles upstream up the Allegheny River. These neighborhoods are some of the most rapidly changing in the city. The Strip, Lawrenceville, Polish Hill, Bloomfield, Stanton Heights, Morningside, Highland Park, and Friendship. And they are rapidly increasing in housing pressure, housing prices, and rental prices. I think we are facing a change here in Pittsburgh that maybe some of our other cities have seen before us, and certainly uh, we thank Ms. Lalani Farah for being here, and also for highlighting the change in global housing in her video push, uh, which I recommend that everybody see, um, and which will be um, um, have public viewings here throughout the city. In that video, what is highlighted is that housing is in, in the global market in housing and global finance and housing has removed people from the equation. And so housing is no longer about the people who live in them, but just a, a piece of a chess game or a, a commodity that is traded amongst the very wealthy. But our job here is to worry about housing our neighbors, or as Ms. Confer Hammond said, building the housing that we need, the housing that our neighbors need. Um, in order to stay in our neighborhoods. And this may be a new discussion for us. The problem of too much investment, the problem of too much money in investment. For decades, we have assumed that our only problem was not having enough finance, not having enough out-of-town investors, that we needed more. Um, but we should really be concerned about what is being built and for whom it is being built and really who benefits and who pays. Uh, so, for example, for years, our, all of our policies at the local level, at the county level, and at the state level have focused on blighted neighborhoods, abandonment, concentrated poverty, and disinvestment. But we should be as equally concerned at the governmental level at moderating the other end of the private marketplace in housing hyperinvestment, gentrification, and displacement. And, and I believe that it's the rightful role of government and even local government to do both. And moreover, that in a place like Pittsburgh, which is not London and it's not New York and it's not um, Berlin, we have, because of our decades of population loss, we have both in the same small city. We have both disinvestment and hyperinvestment. And we should explore the ways that they may not be unrelated, that they may in fact be related, right? And so my constituents have testified to me that as investment has come into their neighborhoods, right, their lower income neighborhoods or, or elderly neighborhoods who are on a fixed income were no longer able to afford that apartment, or that apartment disappeared right from under them, right? They got displaced from their local landlords as those buildings were sold. And they're replaced by people with very high incomes, a very, very different wealth bracket. And so the risk for a neighborhood like Lawrenceville or the Strip District is becoming a neighborhood only for the wealthy and of the wealthy. And that those poorer neighbors and that income distribution that we saw previously in that neighborhood are displaced to neighborhoods that are much cheaper and so create that concentrated poverty. Those are not the neighborhoods we're trying to build. That is not the housing we are trying to build. And so we are, I think it is time for us to really see these as a comprehensive housing picture across the city and figure out how we build the healthy neighborhoods. Let me just give you some numbers, if I may. In the last five years, 
In the strip alone, there, have been, there has been $1.3 billion in real estate development. That's a lot for Pittsburgh. That's only one of our 90 neighborhoods. That was not public funds. Those were not government incentives. That was sheer market investment from Chicago, from Indianapolis, from Toronto, from New York, here in Pittsburgh. It's been a several thousand new apartments, several thousand new offices, and more on the horizon. You'll hear familiar names like Facebook, like Apple, Disney, um, and less familiar ones that are new, like the robot manufacturer, the robot cars, Aurora, formerly Uber, um, Argo AI is another one, with billions of dollars um, to spend in the development of autonomous vehicles. But this creates a scenario, again, where there is not a livable neighborhood there if you're surrounded only by expensive apartments, expensive office places, and you don't have the things that you need to live, especially if you're of lower income. Where's the dentist? Where's the daycare? Where's the drugstore? So I think as a city, we need to be concerned about this massive global real estate actually having an effect on the way people live in the city. How do you get to the things that you need, your neighborhood necessities, um, if they're not there, right? And they used to be there. We used to, be, we used to take that for granted. Our task then together is to help cool off these overheated markets um, where they are overheated, but also entice investment and warm up the cold markets. To this end, in 2019, I worked with leaders and citizens in the Lawrenceville neighborhood to create the first inclusionary zoning ordinance that we know of in Western Pennsylvania. It requires affordable units and new construction of 20 units or more, up to 10% of the units must be affordable. That legislation passed in the summer of 2019 and resulted in 40 new affordable apartments, even during the COVID downturn, where many, many construction projects uh, nationally and across the region were stopped. Residents now, uh, due to the success in Lawrenceville, in the adjoining neighborhoods, residents in Polish Hill and Bloomfield have lobbied for expansion to their neighborhoods. I've introduced that ordinance um, this past summer, and we are having our public hearing to hear from those residents tomorrow here at City Council Chambers behind me. Um, I think one of the important things that we should ask and that we are reminded, I think, and again educated by this video um, push that um, Ms. Farah has created and also um, her website, Make the Shift, is that it's rightful to ask when we see development, development for whom? And this is, is this the development that we had planned for ourselves? But that demands of us that we look at our city and we convene together as neighbors and we design those neighborhoods. We think about what is the neighborhood that we wanna live in and we create the tools to put that in place. Thank you. Thank you so much, Councilwoman. I just want to add, I encourage everybody who can, who has an opinion, to attend that public hearing on inclusionary zoning. I think it's done a lot for Lawrenceville, and it was, in fact, one of the recommendations that our AFFH task force came up with when we released those recommendations. So I absolutely encourage everyone to come to that public hearing. Our next speaker is Rebecca Ranallo from the Office of the Mayor, the Neighborhood Services Manager. Thank you, everyone. Good afternoon, Director Hammond, colleagues, members of council, and commissioners. Ms. Farha, on behalf of the mayor, welcome to Pittsburgh. Thank you for being here. What an honor to have someone with Ms. Farha's passion and expertise with us. I'm incredibly excited to share some time with her later this week to learn how we can align our work here in Pittsburgh with advocates who are fighting the global housing crisis across the world. As some of my colleagues have reflected on today, we have a lot to celebrate in Pittsburgh this Fair Housing Month. I can remember when even mentioning the term inclusionary zoning here raised eyebrows for a lot of people. And yet tomorrow, 
our city council will hear from the public on potentially expanding this tool to serve an even broader section of our city than it is now serving. Other policy tools like rental registration, project-based vouchers, combined with increased brick and mortar investment in affordable, of affordable housing in neighborhoods of opportunity are also moving forward. And yet despite the incredible work that leaders like Councilwoman Gross, Action Housing, and many of you are spearheading to reach these critical milestones, we know the need is still great. While reading about Ms. Farha's background, I learned that the United Nations defines the right to adequate housing as more than just having a roof over our heads. It's the right to live in safety and in dignity in a decent home. Many of us here today may never know the fear that some of our neighbors experience when trying to exercise this right, wondering if a landlord will deny their rental application because of the therapy animal that helps them cope with their PTSD, or because of the accent they spoke with when they called to inquire about a home for their family. When our neighbors are faced with these challenges when trying to access the basic human right of housing, their very dignity is what's at stake. And so I must acknowledge the incredible work of today's hosts. Because of the Pittsburgh Commission on Human Relations, I am proud to say that here in Pittsburgh, you cannot be denied housing because of your race, your age, your gender identity, your range of ability, nation of origin, and many, many other protected classes that these folks here today work every day doggedly to protect for our most marginalized citizens. Because of their work, people from some of our most vulnerable communities have the chance not just to call Pittsburgh home, but to do so with their dignity intact. Thank you, commissioners, for your tireless work to protect these, work, these rights for all of our neighbors. Thank you so much, Rebecca. I really appreciate your support of the commission. Uh, the last person to speak with us today is uh, Leilani Farha, who is the global director of the organization Make the Shift and the former uh, UN Special Rapporteur on Adequate Housing. So in her work as the Special Rapporteur, she's done extensive investigation into what are those systems that are causing us to not be able to to support that essential human right to adequate housing. And in her work now with Make the Shift, looking at how we can change the way that we think about housing and the housing crisis as not just something that is happening uh, on a local scale, but something that's happening on a global scale, and how financial systems have played a role in, in our inability to provide adequate housing. So thank you so much, Leilani Farha, for joining us, and I'm really looking forward to hearing you speak. Thanks everyone for such a warm welcome. Um, I hope I don't disappoint. <laughs> um, it's really amazing to be standing here with the mayor's office, city councilor, fair housing advocates, and the Human Relations Commission. Um, these sorts of events, press conferences, don't happen in city halls often enough. So this is very important and I am privileged to be part of it. I'm also very privileged to help launch Fair Housing Month. I didn't even know such a thing existed until I was invited in. Uh, and I think it's wonderful to, to spend a month, and hopefully more, looking at what I consider to be certainly one of the most pressing social issues not just in the United States, but of course, globally. And that is the housing crisis that really is rooted in the issue of affordability that then leads to other issues like insecurity and homelessness. In my role um, as UN Rapporteur, a position I held from 2014 to 2020, I was able to identify this phenomenon of financialization of housing. That's where 
as other speakers have said, housing is treated as a commodity, a place to park, grow, leverage, and hide capital. And what I brought to the conversation, that, that had actually been document, documented by others. Uh, lots of academics, urban geographers had identified the issue. But what I was able to bring to the conversation, I think, was to expose how financialization actually undermines a human right, specifically the human right to housing. I think the financialization of housing continues to represent a significant risk to most cities and communities around the world. It's not um, decreasing, it's on the rise. One might have thought with a global pandemic, when housing is so central to human health, well-being and life itself, that governments would have taken the opportunity to take a step back and say, wait a second, we gotta make sure everyone has access to affordable, secure housing in keeping with our human rights obligations as governments. In fact, the opposite happened strangely. What we saw was a march, the march of these institutional investors, private equity firms, pension funds, insurance companies as the main actors, as well as some of the other actors we heard, big corporate entities, marching into communities and gobbling up affordable housing and turning it into luxury and less affordable housing and pushing people out of their communities in the middle of a pandemic. Pretty shocking. The analogy I like to draw is to ants at a picnic. So you're at the picnic and you're sitting on this nice blanket and you're drinking champagne and you've got some beautiful cheeses and grapes and other fruits and you're sipping your champagne and you don't notice as the ants come marching in and take away the best of the food, the best of the crumbs. The government are the champagne sippers. The ants are the financial actors, those institutional investors. And I think it's time for us to end the picnic. And I think here in Pittsburgh, you're confronting this head on. What I'm seeing here, and I've, I've been here a day, but I've become pretty expert at reading things quickly and digesting and listening to people closely. I've been to Pittsburgh one other time, I have to admit. So I had a little bit of knowledge in advance, but outdated. But what I'm seeing are a lot of red flags. And what I'm hearing from, you've heard from the other panelists, uh, uh, or speakers, I should say, there are some real red flags. Affordability is increasingly becoming an issue. There's a lack of synchronicity, and I see this in so many cities, between household incomes and average incomes and the cost of housing. Those things should actually be in sync. But what we find is Rents are escalating, home prices are less escalating, and wages stay pretty stagnant. And certainly don't increase, the, even if they do increase, they don't increase at the same rate as the cost of housing. We're seeing, and this is very disturbing to me, I read the, uh, that there was a 2021 census that documented in the last decade a 13% decrease in the number of African Americans living here. I find that shocking. The race dimensions in this country and clearly in this city with respect to the affordability or lack of affordability of housing and the systems that underpin that are so clear and stark and in my opinion have to be addressed on an urgent and priority basis. And that's a tall task for sure. But it has to be done because we can't live with ra gross racial inequality any longer in this country, in this city, or anywhere else for that matter. When I hear that the corporates are pouring in into one neighborhood, I think it was $1.3 billion, then we do have to ask the question, who is this for? 
Who benefits? And sadly, the answer is always the same. It's people who are already pretty well off, they're benefiting, and people who aren't are faring worse. I'm really fearful that Pittsburgh will soon not look like the city you once knew. It's already, that's already happening with the displacement of African Americans. So I think now you have a window of opportunity. I think things aren't great here, but they could be a whole lot worse. I think there's a window of opportunity, but I think the action has to be concerted and swift. You're in a good place. You have a proclamation that the city is a human rights city from 2011. That's a good foundation. Now, you have to breathe life into that. That doesn't, you know, proclamation, proclamation. You, you have to breathe life into that. And the way that you breathe life into that is through adopting human rights compliant policies, legislation, and programs. You have to ask yourself, what does a real human rights city look like? Well, I'll tell you what it doesn't look like. It doesn't look like 13% of the African and Amer American population being displaced to places where there's no employment and no transportation. I think what I'd like to say to the city is that you have to do everything you can right now to protect your communities, protect every single affordable unit that you have now. Because those units, it's the affordable units that these big institutional actors are going after. That's what they want. So your job as the city is to protect those units. A human rights-based approach to housing would have the city ask themselves, with every decision taken, will this benefit those most in need? That is human rights leadership and governance. The city should ask itself, have we consulted with those most affected in, in this possible decision? One of the errors that a lot of governments make, and I'm, I'm, I'm putting this out as a warning, is to think that in our still fairly neoliberal system, where tenants have weak protections, and where developers and institutional investors have a lot of power, there is a common error on the part of governments to believe that the institutional investors and the housing developers are the saviors, that they are going to save Pittsburgh, that they are going to create the necessary affordable housing. That narrative is dead. We have seen over the last 40 years practically that the neoliberal enterprise has resulted in the housing crisis we find in our cities across this nation and across the world. And that those actors do not deserve tax breaks and special tax treatment and um, uh, cheap money, cheap loans, etc., because they are only using those things to create the problem that we have. Those things do not help solve the housing crisis. So I'm going to end with this just to say a lot of governments feel like human rights are a stick. You know, you got all these advocates after you and they're beating you down with this human rights stick. And I'd like to, us to shift our perception of human rights, to understand human rights as a carrot. A human rights framework can, can give to the city the tools it needs, the principles it needs to create a fairer, more equal, and more peaceful society. Thanks. Thank you so much, Ms. Farha. I think I really, I really love what you said about breathing life into the things that we've committed to. 
breathing life into the idea of what is a human rights city? Are we fulfilling that? Breathing life into the idea of the AFFH mandate, are we living that in every decision? Are we making it possible for us to have fair housing in our city? Is it possible to have adequate housing in our city? And if not, what do we do next? How do we address it? We need to breathe life into those activities and to make it not a chore, but it is a reward when we're really serving our public, our population, we're serving our neighbors and creating the Pittsburgh that we need to have. So thank you so much, Ms. Farha, and thank you everyone for joining us. I appreciate your presence and I'm looking forward to seeing you for the rest of Fair Housing Month. Uh, look on our website for more activities and, and more things to engage with us as we move through Fair Housing Month in the City of Pittsburgh. Thank you.